So I welcome you all to this conversation hour by the the Open Community Wikimedia, a recognized user group affiliate of the Wikimedia Foundation, established on 31 July 2021 and officially recognized on 16 January 2022. DCW is named after the Deoband Islamic Seminary and is dedicated to enriching Wikipedia and its sister projects with knowledge related to global Muslim academia, scholarship, history, and culture. Operating on a global scale and across multiple languages, DCW's mission is to make this information accessible to a wider audience. DCW leads several impactful initiatives, including the DCW Conversation R and Heritage Lens, along with collaborative projects such as Durban Yoruba Collaborative Project and DCW K Editathon. Most recently, in January 2024, DCW introduced the first edition of the Wiki Loves Muslim Academia. Marking another milestone in its ongoing efforts to contribute valuable content to the Wikimedia ecosystem. We're excited to delve into the work of this dynamic community and explore how it continues to make significant contributions to global knowledge. So we're having this, the 20th DCW Conversation R, and it's about Elevate with Evaluation. So in this, Evaluate, I Trade, and Adapt. It is one of the core movement strategy recommendations which the Wikimedia movement hopes to achieve by 2030. In this edition of DCW Conversation R, we'll be exploring best evaluation practices. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce our special guest for this Conversation R, Jessica, with a rich background in politics, history, and a master's in development studies. Jessica has spent the past 17 years leading impactful projects across the globe. Her work has empowered communities from Colombia to Brazil, focusing on education, peace building, and gender equity. Now serving as the lead learning and evaluation program officer, Jessica brings a wealth of experience and a global perspective that aligns perfectly with our goals. Beyond her professional achievements, she is a passionate, she is passionate about volunteering, practicing capoeira, which is for the people who don't know, it's a martial art, uh, Afro-Brazilian martial art, and exploring diverse cultures, often with her philosophical sausage dog, Russo, by her side. So we're excited to hear from Jessica today and learn from her incredible journey. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Welcome, Jessica. We're really excited to hear you out. Uh, for others, I would like to inform this meeting is being recorded. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And so thank you, Ediba, um, Sharif, Ayafi, all the um, Dioban community for this invitation. Um, I don't think I need to introduce myself after that such wonderful introduction that you gave. Um, so I wanted to say that, that I hope to make this conversation more interactive. Um, I would love to hear your voices or read you on the chat. Um, it's okay also just to listen in, um, but if you would like to interact, um, that would be fantastic and it will make this much richer. Um, also just raise your hand at any point if you have a question or a comment and we can stop and go through it. Um, I also hope to leave some time at the end for that. And I will also share here the link of the presentation so for those of you wanting to um, to follow it on your screens, and also um, I'm linking in a lot of other resources you can look at afterwards. And let me know if I'm speaking too quickly. I tend to do so when I get excited. So um, let me know. So three things I hope you take away from this conversation. It will be a lot of information, um, but the three key things is one, learning and evaluation is not only about numbers. It's really about learning if and how you are achieving your goals. You can take some small steps. Sometimes when we talk about learning and evaluation plans, people get very scared. They think it's something very complex that you need special skills. And you do need to build some skills. You do need to plan for this. You do need to put some of the team time into this. But you can start small 
and see how important that is going to be from your work. And the third point is it is a team effort. You can't just bring one in one expert in to do the learning and evaluation. The learning has to happen as a team. So I just want to do a little quick room check. You can use the chat. Um, what what is a theory of change? How many of you are familiar with that concept? Just you can say yes or no in the chat or use an emoji. How comfortable are we with the concept of a theory of change? So some of us, it's new, no idea. No, fantastic. This is great. We can go over the basic concepts. Any idea in the chat of what a learning and evaluation plan can involve? Any idea when you think of a learning and evaluation plan, what does that involve? You can just share some ideas on the chat. Okay, let's look into this then. So when we talk about a learning and evaluation framework, we start with the theory of change. This is why theory of change is important. And it may sound like a big word, but it is a simple com con con um, it is a simple term if you understand, if we break it down, a, a simple concept. So really a theory of change is what do I hope to achieve? What are my objectives? Whenever we think about a project we're doing in Wikimedia or in our lives, we think this is my objective. This is the change I want to bring about. And then I think about how I hope to do that. What are my strategies to bring about this change? And I've defined some strategies. I must be thinking that these are the best strategies. Why have I chosen these strategies and not other strategies? So I'm making some assumptions. I'm thinking that these are the right strategies and these will work to bring about the change that I need. So basically a theory of change is understanding what is uh, the change that I wanna create? What are the strategies that I think are gonna bring that change? And why am I assuming that those strategies are the right ones and not other ones? And that is a theory of change. And why is it important as a starting point to understand, to build a learning and evaluation plan? Because once I have that theory of change, that's what determines what I need to learn, what data I need to collect, what do I need to learn from my work? And the next step then is to define key learning questions. So what do I need to learn from my work to see if really, the strategies that I'm implementing are the right ones. Are they bringing about that change that, I, that I'm looking for? And if they aren't, what decisions do I need to make? How do I stop, think about this, and change those strategies if necessary? So those are my learning questions. What do I need to learn from my work? And only then do I decide what data do I need to collect to answer these questions? What information is going to help me learn from my work? When do I do this? Who does this? What tools will I use to do this? Will it be a survey? Will it be um, uh, what numbers, what statistics do I need? Um, will I need to interview people? So it's really important to go through this process because sometimes in evaluation plans, we start with thinking about the numbers that we need. Do I need to know how many people edited? Um, but maybe that's not actually teaching me what I need to learn about my work. And we're gonna look through some examples here. And the last point is probably the most important. We sometimes have a clear theory of change. We understand what we need to learn from our work. We have, we collect a lot of data, we put it into a nice report, but we don't take the time. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you can go ahead. I think I was muted. Yeah, 
Okay, I think I was I was muted, but I think everybody can hear me now. Okay, we don't yeah. take a time as the team to actually uh, sit down and reflect on that on those findings and to think about if we need to change our strategy. Um, and also, we don't do that with the people that are participating in our uh, in our events, in our trainings. So it's not only about the team using this data to learn, but it's us learning in a participatory way to bring in those students, those teachers, those new editors, uh, and to learn with them um, of and evaluate with them how our work is doing. So I just want to recap here. A theory of change is this idea that if we implement X strategy, I am going to achieve a certain outcome, Y. So if I implement X, I'm going to achieve Y in the short run, which is within the time frame of my project. So if I establish a project with some goals and some strategies for one year, the outcomes is what I hope to achieve in that year and measure. And then the longer term impact, which may I may see three, five or 10 years down the line. So I want to take a moment there. Um, to stop and ask if anybody either opening up their mic or on the chat can share in a very short sentence, what is their theory of change in your project? What are you hoping to achieve and what are your strategies to achieve that? And this is for the participants. You can unmute yourself to ask the question or just put it in the chat box. I'm going to read that for you. Thank you. Whilst we warm up our ideas, think have that question in the back of your head. Think about you're all working on projects. Um, it can be a Wikimedia project. It can also be a project outside of the Wikimedia community in your lives. So start thinking about what is your theory of change? How would you organize your project into this, these concepts? So let's look at an example. I love working in education. I know many of you probably also work in education. So I want to look at an example from a project um, from Bolivia. Um, a Wikimedia project focused on training teachers so that they can um, use Wikipedia as a tool in the classroom, right? So this project said, look, the change that we want to bring about within this project is that teachers will be aware of how to use Wikipedia as a pedagogical tool within the classroom. They'll incorporate this into their lesson plan but also that those teachers will become part of the Wikimedia community. And I'm hoping that this will happen within the project, but I'm hoping that in the longer run, Wikipedia will be viewed positively by educators. We know that there's a lot of stigma attached to Wikipedia in the educational world. Um, I'm hoping that those teachers will teach young people how to use Wikipedia uh, correctly and critically and build the skills that they need to do this. And I also hope that teachers will be motivated to be part of our Wikimedia community and why not also become uh, content contributors. So these are the things that they want. What are some of the strategies they developed? Um, the idea there is, um, I'd like to interrupt you here. There's a question uh, by Mr. Ralphie. Is there reading yeah. Wikipedia in the classroom? That's what you mean? The teachers are going to do that? Or the students. Yes, this is an example from reading Wikipedia in the classroom. Yeah, just an, an example to understand the theory of change. Thanks, Rafi, for the question. So here are some of the strategies. They're going to um, train teachers to use, to, to use Wikipedia as a tool. They're going to create guides and resources in local languages because they think it's so important for it to be translated into local languages and distributed digitally to these schools. And they're going to provide resources for teachers to participate in Wikimedia events. So things like scholarships for those teachers to go to events. So these are some of the strategies. 
we don't need to understand this project in detail. I'm just using as an example so that you can see what it, it means to define an outcome, an impact, and a strategy, okay? What are some of the things that they are assuming here? Some of the assumptions that they're making is that teachers will have the time and the interest to incorporate this into the classroom. We know teachers often don't have the time or the interest to, to do this. They have a lot to do. That printed booklets in different languages is a good solution. They could have thought of different ways of training, but they decided that this was the way they were training. They want, um, they, they are assuming that the connectivity will not be a barrier. And they're assuming that the authorities, educational authorities will actually support this work and let teachers do this. So there's a lot of assumptions of why that strategy is going to work, right? So this is just an example so that you can think of what does it involve to define your theory of change? The next thing is, okay, what do they need to learn? What does the group in Bolivia need to learn to see if that strategy is working? So what are learning questions? Learning questions are those questions that if answered, they will tell me, yes, I am achieving that change or no, I'm not achieving it. And why I'm not achieving it. Not only to say, no, the teachers didn't come, they weren't trained, but why didn't they come? And why didn't they learn the skills? Why aren't they incorporating this into the classroom? Or if they did, what was it in our strategy that worked? Was it that we created it in local languages? Was it that the training was you know, 10 sessions and not five? Was it because we provided um, some resources for transport and for connectivity? What was it in our strategy that helped us work, helped, it, helped this change come, become, come about? So good learning questions, they need to be applicable. So we have to be able to try to answer these questions within the time frame of our project. We can have big questions, but if we don't have the time or the resources to answer them, then they're not helpful. We need to be able to um, take action based on what we learn from this. So if I get information from the, from the data I collect, how do I make that useful in my project plan and take action according to that? what learning questions are. What do you think some good learning questions would be for our example here, our education example? Anybody can put in the chat, what, or you can open your mic as well. What would be some good things that they should learn, they should ask themselves to be able to know if their strategy is working? Um, is it about the teachers or uh, the students? What are you mentioning here? Uh, the, can you please uh, explain that? I think some of the people who are uh, here are not understanding what you exactly meant. So they don't know how to ask or what to ask exactly. So it would be great if you could just repeat this a little. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for that. So we looked at our example here and we said that this is the change these are the, ch the changes that the group in Bolivia want to create, right? This is their theory of change. If we implement these strategies, then these are the outcomes that we're going to achieve, right? And to do this, they're going to think about what do we need to learn from our work? What questions do we need to ask ourselves to test if this is working or not? So that was my question. What do you think would be some questions this team should be investigating, researching, to know if they're achieving this goal. Um, Rafi has a question here. Are teachers being able to properly use the printed materials? Are they being able to understand how the how behind the things happening in Wikipedia? Yeah. This is brilliant, Rafi. Thank you. So are they able to actually use the materials? This is a wonderful question. I'm assuming that those materials are working, right? That they're using them. Um,
Or is my teaching style resonating with my students? That's really important. So if I'm training teachers, am I training them in the right way? Am I giving them enough um, examples? Am I giving them enough time? Am I giving them enough support? And are those teachers able to also teach their, their students in the right way? If they're using this in the classroom, are they using it in the right way? Brilliant, thank you. And I will add more cat memes, please. Okay. <laughs> so let's look at some of the questions. These are just examples. The questions you came up with are yeah, brilliant. There's, um, there's another question by Chinu. We should check on ourselves in regular intervals. Are we achieving what we were estimated for? And what is working well and what needs to improve? Exactly, Chino. That's that's perfect. That's exactly what we should do with the learning and evaluation plan. How do we check in at regular intervals? And this is why we're asking these questions, right? Yeah. So just to recap some of the questions I thought of that can be added to the great ones that you were thinking is, you know, what, what activities help teachers, teachers complete the training? You know, was it that we provided connectivity? Was it that we you know, went to the rural areas where they were and we did face-to-face -face training. What were, what were the key things that helped people complete the training? And if they didn't complete the training, what was missing? You know, was there a barrier in transport? Was it that the teacher wasn't a great trainer? Um, what were the some of the issues? Are the teachers actually using this in the classroom? So I'm not only interested in knowing if they completed the training, but I actually want to know if my outcome, if that result that I wanted is happening, are they using Wikipedia in the classroom? And if they're not, what are some of the barriers? Are they finding it difficult because they can't, they don't have the time to do it because maybe the headmaster of the school doesn't allow them to do it? What are some of those barriers? Have teachers' perspectives about Wikipedia changed after the program? Remember, one of the goals that we wanted was not only that the teachers are using it in the classroom and they're teaching students, but also that they think and talk about Wikipedia differently, right? So I want to go beyond in my learning and evaluation to how many teachers participated in the training, right? That's important for me to know what we call an output, right? What did I achieve from this activity? Yes, 80% of teachers completed the training, but what did they actually do with that? And how is this useful for the goal that I want? to achieve, right? So then once we define those questions, then we can think of what data we should be collecting, not before. So I want to ask again in the chat, now that I, we have some, some of these great questions, um, such as the one that Rafi asked, um, the one, the examples that I gave, what type of data do we need to collect to answer these questions? Um, the learning outcomes of the students could be a good source, right? Okay, yeah, that's a great idea. Anything else? Um, surveys? Honey surveys? says, yeah. So surveys is is great. It's a method to collect data, yeah. right? but yes. it's not the data in itself. So let's think before what method we're going to use. Let's think of what data we want to collect. Um, since uh, we need uh, one question was, are the teacher using Wikipedia in the classroom? We can probably ask uh, after six months of the training ends, uh, ask the teachers that are they using this in the classroom? Mm -hmm. If yes, how is it going? If not, what are the barriers? So we can probably uh, pick all the learning courses first and then try to think uh, how we can get the answers. Then we'll get what data should we collect. Thank you, Rafi. That's a great example. And Sana, Sana Sabir says in the chat, before collecting data, we need to know what problem you are going to solve with that. 
And that's why the learning questions are important because I need to collect data that's going to help me learn. So to give Rafi's example, I might know that 50% of the teachers are are using it in the classroom because they say they're going to they're using it in the classroom. They report back after 6 months, yes, I am using it in the classroom. But do I understand why the other 50% aren't? Does that does that data help me understand why 50% aren't? Maybe I need to dig a little bit deeper and understand what what happened with that 50% that aren't using it. And what maybe I need to consider the next time I do a training um, or a program to include strategies to also support that that 50%? Or what really worked with the 50% that are doing it? What were the key factors that helped them implement it? And was that because of something I did or was it something external? So that that is what I want to, um, I want to learn and the problem I want to solve. How do I make sure that I am... Um, I am, I'm understanding what's working and what's not working. Tracking how often and why students use Wikipedia in their research. That's a great, that's a great data point. Um, are, we want students to use Wikipedia more responsibly. Can we track if they're using it in their research? Now, this is a tricky point because then we have to define, we can have great learning questions and we can, to find great data that we want to collect. But then we have to look at, okay, do we have the resources, the tools and the time to collect this data? And sometimes we don't. So we need to define what we can actually do um, within the time frame of our project and with the tools that we have, right? So tracking maybe over time, how students use it in their research might be something complex, but maybe we can think of ways of doing this through the teachers, for example. So let's go on um, just to clarify, and this is an, often a, a mistake I see when people talk about data. They think it's only about numbers, right? Only measurable things that we can quantify. So number of participants, number of printed books created. But data is also qualitative. Data is also about perceptions. So like that, like Rafi was saying, what, how does the teacher perceive Wikipedia afterwards? How are they using it in the classroom? Their perception of that use in the classroom. It's about opinions, testimonies, representations. How are people feeling about Wikipedia after this is also a data point, right? And sometimes qualitative data really helps us dig deeper and understand not just what happened, are they using it, 50% are, but why or why not? And that is going to help me inform my strategy, not only the number, okay? Safdar, yes, qualitative data has to be uh, understood in a way that helps us make decisions. So we can't have, obviously, just, you know, texts and texts of, 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 of perceptions and opinions. We have to be able to put that into something that's readable and to some extent quantified. So we can say the number of teachers believe this um, and this is the main reasons why they, 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 the, the key things that allowed them to include it into the classroom are the key things that didn't. So we need to be able to not necessarily turn everything into numbers, but, but when we collect qualitative data, make it um, uh, digest that data in a way that can help us learn, um, reach conclusions and be able to adjust our strategy if needed. I've gone over this. So let's look at some of the data that would be interesting to collect based on our example. Um, you gave some good examples in the chat. Here are a few more that I was thinking about. Um, feedback from what was the most effective strategy for those teachers to gain their, their skills. Um, and not just very gen general feedback. Sometimes we we interview people or we have surveys where we're just like, was it good? Yes, it was good. People were satisfied. But we want to understand really what, what, what it was that worked. Was it the printed format? Was it the translation? Was it the resources? Was it that the trainer connected with them in their local language? What were those key, those key things? 
Um, also, perceptions that can be put into numbers, as Sa Safda was saying, we can take those perceptions into a percentage of people that feel that they have the skills to support this in the classroom, a percentage of teachers that are motivated to, in to do this, um, et cetera. If we, if we look at some of the other strategies, uh, more data points will come up. For example, we wanted those teachers to be part of the community. Beyond doing the work of incorporating Wikipedia into the classroom, we also wanted them to be part of the Wikimedia community and perhaps even to edit and to contribute you know, content and train others. So we might wanna see if they are actually doing that, if they have the skills to be able to do that, like be some of the data points that we wanna also collect. Oh, sorry. So I wanna take this to maybe an example. We've talked a lot about education, but that might not resonate with some of you who are in the room. So this is a common example, uh, a common headache in the Wikimedia movement, right? How can we get new volunteer editors to stick, right? We've tried loads of strategies, some editathons, to trainings, to camps. What really works to get a new editor to stick, right? So let's say, You've seen that your edit-a-thons one-off training is not working to keep volunteers editing. And you think, okay, I need a longer training program that teaches people how to edit, but perhaps also involves other skills development. Maybe they're young people who want to build uh, skills in technology or media literacy skills, or just things that will be good on their CV. And that's going to motivate them to be part of the training and to edit. Um, and if I want them to participate beyond the training and actually be part of the movement, you know, maybe I want to invite them to some cool meetups where we can integrate more and have fun, and that might work better for, for retention. So I'm making an assumption here that if I change my strategy to longer training, include some other skills, professional development, and bring in those young people into meetups, this is going to work better, right? So I'm explaining like a theoretical project. So your learning question might be, I want to know if this longer training is, is useful. I want to know if it's a better format for training them in the skills they need. Is this investment worthwhile? Because it costs me a lot more time, money, team effort than just you know one editathon. So this is a question I might want to ask myself. Now, what do I see in projects? This is, I'm taking this from reading hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of grant projects. And they have this great theory of change. And then when you come to the metrics, the data they want to collect, they say participants that completed the course. Okay, that's great for me to see an immediate result, but am I learning from what really helped them engaged? Are they actually using these skills? Are they actually editing? Are they actually coming into the Wikimedia movement? Do they feel like they belong in the Wikimedia movement? Are they coming to the meetups? What makes them come to the meetups? These are questions that I'm not gonna get from this metric. And usually the metrics that a lot of communities focus on are these output metrics, which just tell me what might have happened, but not the why. So what could be some additional metrics here? I could have feedback of why participants continued to edit and come to meetups, but also, you know, what are some of the barriers? Why did that person not show up? Sometimes feedback through surveys is very limited. People don't reply to surveys. So maybe I can not take a representative group of people. I'm not getting a statistic in terms of if I've uh, trained a hundred people, I'm questioning a hundred people of why they didn't come back, but maybe I can look at some case studies and I can document the case of one participant that did come back and is very active and to understand why, one case of one that's not so active and why, and one case of one that definitely didn't come back and why. So I can do a more qualitative analysis there and learn from those three uh, case studies. Also, the team might have a lot of information. Sometimes a lot of the data isn't out there just with the participants. It's also with the team of volunteers who are leading the training, who have been in, in contact with some of these, um, with these new editors, and they might know what's working or not working. But often we don't take the time to sit down as a team 
and use methods to be able to reflect and collect that data from what's in our head. We use them as anecdotes, but we don't actually sometimes um, systematically collect data that our teams have. Um, so you might ask, great, this is, seems like a lot of work. How do I collect all of this? We're a very small group, we're all volunteers, we don't have staff for this, so we have very small uh, user group with only one paid staff. Like this seems very difficult. And what I want you to take from this is, I'm sharing a lot of ideas of what can be done and not all of it can be done and certainly not in you know, your first project or if you're only starting um, to do this type of deeper learning and evaluation. There are small things that you can do. And I'll give you an example from our Let's Connect um, learning clinics is that we tried in the beginning to have a learning clinic and then send out a survey afterwards of like uh, loads of questions, like what did you learn? How are you using this? And obviously the re response rate was, was quite low. So we started a different strategy of having within the learning clinic, a quick poll um, to check you know, how people felt about out what they learned in the session, how they might use this in future. And then months afterwards, we do a wider um, survey and interview process where we look at cases where people are using the knowledge or aren't using the knowledge and why that is the case. So incorporating into your training quick polls, quick surveys, not even to not only to test perception, but to also test if people are gaining some of the skills that you're hoping to, to train them in. Um, then that's really useful. Um, I know editor retention is a big thing. Whenever I've had this discussion with communities, they're like, that sounds great. But if one of the things we want to measure is that if is that person continuing to, to contribute to Wikimedia projects, um, there aren't really good tools to do this. And I know that this is a limitation, but there are uh, a few things that you can do. I won't go into detail uh, now, but we can even have another session on this. And I've linked in a couple of resources. One is uh, data queries that you can do to measure retention. There's a tutorial and a code, um, and I can give you contact of the person that can do more in-depth training on this. And also using the event registration tool, I've linked in the, the, uh, um, the, pay, the meta page to the tool, is gonna help us with time be able to track that data. So if I use the event registration tool, um, we will be integrating tools to be able to measure retention of those people that went to your event um, in the future. And it's all today linked into the program and events dashboard. But there's also other ways of collecting qualitative data because of time. I won't go into um, a lot of examples. We have also a video where these examples are explained and they've linked into this presentation. But thinking of things like it doesn't only have to be, you know, an interview and text and presentations. You can also have videos, uh, images, pictures of teachers capturing their perception or telling what they're doing in the classroom. Um, so there's ways of capturing those stories that don't need to be very uh, complex or heavy for your team and can actually be fun and engaging for those um, participants. Uh, a few tools that I put in there of ways also to collect stories um, visually. Um, and this is the point that I wanna finish on, which is, uh, really taking the time to learn from the data. So it, it's not useful to collect loads of interviews, loads of survey data, have loads of statistics on the program and events dashboard, and then just write it in a report to send to the foundation or to the community or whoever you send the reports to. Take the time as a team to go through that data, to think about what that data is telling you and what that means for your next plan. Or if you're in the moment of implementation, as Shinu said, how do we stop and reflect whilst we're implementing to think, wow, teachers aren't coming because they are having difficulties with transport or they're having difficulties because the material is very long or they're having difficulties because the training wasn't really translated into the language they need. And those are things that 
if we catch them in time, you can perhaps change in your strategy. Um, but this takes uh, you using that data to reflect on it and make decisions, but also to communicate with the communities involved. A lot of the time, we do we we gather a lot of data, but we don't even share that with the participants. So another example from Let's Connect is when we collect survey data um, or interviews or collect stories, videos, we, we give that back to the community and say, look, this is what we learned from you. And this is what we're doing to change our strategy or what we're going to continue because it's working well. So making that public and having participants actually like engage with that, um, that learning is, is really important. Um, I will stop there. There's just a few tips at the end of things that you should consider in terms of planning for this, timing, resources. Um, and at the end, I put in some extra resources. This is a, a, a nice exercise that maybe you can do with your, with your teams, which is um, to think about all this complex <laughs> learning and evaluation theory of change through what I call the cookie challenge. So it's taking this to a very simple daily activity and to understand through that, what does it mean to have input, output, outcome, impact uh, metrics? Loads of different videos of things, uh, le learning clinics that we've developed on this topic. And I also created uh, like a toolkit of possible metrics that would be interesting for movement-wide activity. I've talked a lot about education today. But here are examples of um, work that is might have an impact in terms of policy advocacy, in terms of glam, in terms of you know culture and heritage. So there's a lot of other uh, learning questions and metrics examples here. I hope that's useful. Um, and uh, I am now open to all the questions and comments. I'm sorry I've been very bad with reviewing the chat, but I will do that now. It was an absolute amazing presentation. We really enjoyed it. I hope the others enjoyed too. Yes, Rafi, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Hello, everyone. And thanks, Jessica, for this amazing presentation. I know learning and evaluation is a huge and complex area of uh, you know research and, and study. But thanks a lot for bringing this uh, in a very short period of time. So my question is, a bit, how do you say, generalized. That is, um, you know, uh, for learning the process of learning and evaluation, there are some uh, ways in the movement. Like uh, I learned this in the reading equipment in the classroom program training of the trainers. My younger brother learned this in the organizers lab training, uh, organizers lab training program. So these are closed. And there are some Let's Connect learning clinics that are open for most of the Let's Connect uh, you know, participants. So uh, are there like, uh, you know, we need this very broadly in our movement, Spe specifically, I have noticed that in our grant programs, most people submit the learning and evaluation metrics just because we need to submit this. So someone asked me from uh, India just a few days ago that uh, he needs to buy some uh, photography gears and publish some magazines. How can he, uh, you know, uh, design his grant proposal? So I was looking for previous grant reports that have been taken for uh, photography gears and publications. And, you know, I found out that almost none of them had any proper learning and evaluation. So uh, what can be a good strategy? Like, uh, yeah, uh, we can give a good idea of what learning and evaluation can be through these short uh, sessions. But we need to, you know, push this very broadly in the movement to collect the, uh, you know, knowledge and experience of the movement uh, in a well-documented way. Uh, I'm sorry, this uh, question might, be, might seem very generalized, but as a, com uh, as a community leader, I, I think this is very important to document our learnings collectively. Yeah, thanks for that reflection, Rafi. And that's something I struggled with in the last two years in this role 
is I think that the movement and particularly the foundation had pushed for certain metrics very focused on how many edits and how many um, like new volunteers are editing. And whilst they're important for the movement, of course, we need that so our projects can grow and our community can grow. There were a lot of other things that communities were doing, like what you, the diff post that you just shared, which is a great way of reflecting, you know, what is engaging these young people? What are some of the barriers? Um, and the work that you do goes much beyond how many edits and, and contents um, and the learning about that is it's much deeper. And so whilst we've, made the application form much more broader and created guidelines for this type of learning. I feel that a lot of communities haven't made that kind of mindset shift yet. So they're still focusing on the, 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 those numbers. Um, and they also find, that's why I started with the point of, you know, you can take small steps, right? So when we explain this, people are like, oh, but we, we don't have the resources to do that. And we don't have the expertise in our teams, but they'll do like a hundred activities in the year. And I would say, why don't you reduce that to 80 activities and dedicate the time to learning and starting to gather more information that you can learn from. Um, and I think some communities have taken those steps. It doesn't always come out clearly in the reporting, um, but I think there have been some shifts and I can look at some, some examples to show you. Uh, and I think that Let's Connect has been a platform to share some of that learning in, in a different way, a different way from the from the reporting. But you're absolutely right that that's a challenge. Um, I And yeah, I've struggled with that. I wanted to maybe touch on this point about qualitative data always being quantified. Um, to some to some extent, um, qualitative data, you know, when when we're talking about perceptions, it's interesting to look at it in terms of, you know, a number or a conclusion from that all that data. But sometimes a story can be told without quantifying the story. And we 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 can't say this is the experience for everybody, but it's the experience for a number of the people involved. And so something that is good is to combine different methods, right? So I'll give an example of the evaluation I'm doing now for Let's Connect. I'm using four different methods. So one is to collect a survey and I'm trying to make it as representative as possible and that data will be quantified, right? So if how many people say that they are using what they learned and let's connect in their communities, right? And then quantify that data, which is a qualitative because it's a perception, right? If they're using it, if they're not using it and why that's the case. Um, then we're using like more, uh, let's say, um, the data we can verify through actual participation. So how many people who are registered actually participate, what regions they're from. So it's like more like um, uh, uh, the numbers of participation, the outputs. And then I'm interviewing some case studies to understand like about their participation and particularly people who, who registered and never participated because those are the ones I'm really interested in learning more about and what do we need to do to, to, to incentivize them. Um, and then being able to, um, yeah, so sorry, those three methods to tell the story. And those stories of the case studies, they can't really be quantified, but the detail of why that something is happening is what I want to show as, as, a, as, an, as an example. And that might be representative of other people who are participating or not participating. So um, yeah, just, just to say that not everything is, can be put into a quantity because it doesn't necessarily represent the full scale of participants. I would like to ask the group here, we always say let's connect is 
a space for like a lot of like safety and honesty. And um, I always try to explain this as like clearly as simply as possible, but I, I don't know if I achieve that goal. I'd like to hear from those who said in the beginning that this is very new to them. Is it, did you learn some things in, in, in this presentation that are useful or is it still a little bit complex? I'll come back to your question, Afi. <laughs> Does anybody want to share if, if this information at this level is, is very or is it clear? Yes, I can repeat the question. So I just wanted to get feedback from you. This is an example of in 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 the call feedback. I just wanted to get feedback from you if when I explain this, I try to like simplify it the best I can, but sometimes I don't know if I reach that objective. So I want to know if this was clear to you or there were things that maybe can explain a bit easier. <laughs> okay maybe you can sit on that and you can send me a message on telegram or email afterwards and give me your your thoughts um so just to conclude the question from um, Afi on what a good evaluation report looks like. This is a really good question because you need to think who are you sharing the report to, right? Um, so thinking about your audience is, the, mo is the, the, the number one question, right? What am I wanting to show from my results and to who and why is this important? So for example, if I do, a, I'm gonna use the Let's Connect evaluation that I'm doing now as an example. Again, if I want to um, put together this, this report to show Mariana, the CEO of the Wikimedia Foundation, that Let's Connect is having an impact and it's important to continue to support it, I'm going to want to do something very short to the point to show key numbers, but tell a story that is like more personal and has impact of maybe one of those case studies. And in like one page or one you know, slide deck, very concrete, be able to say, this is the impact we're having and this is why it's important because she's not going to engage with something very long. But if I'm doing it for Let's Connect participants, you know, maybe we want to go in much deeper and understand as a collective what's working, what not working. We want to look at some of those uh, numbers uh, in more detail. So I might put together, you know, a presentation where I capture all this or actually a document that I'll put on Meta. I'll, I can share an example in the presentation of a learning report we put together. The important thing is to use the quantitative and qualitative information and bring that together and reach some like good learning conclusions that I can discuss with people. So it's just not a lot of data there. This is what people said in interviews. These are the statistics, but how do I bring this together and really make this concrete? I think we're two minutes to um, drop. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, yeah, that's it. So, so others who still have some questions, they can connect with Jessica on Telegram, as you said, and you can find her on LinkedIn and other platforms. Um, right, Jessica. So, or you can send an email to her. Could you please share your email here in the chat box? Yeah. Okay. So thanks for this amazing and simple presentation, Jessica. We really enjoyed it and uh, it's really good to see how you simplify the concept. And even we have some students from high school, as we can see in the chat box, even she was able to understand it perfectly. So it, it's actually the goal you wanted to achieve. It was really simple and understandable. <laughs> okay, and for the others uh, who stayed here and for the other participants, uh, we're really thankful and grateful you took up the time and we hope to see you in the next conversation hour.
Thank you, everyone, again. Okay, then. Bye-bye.